problem. Yeah, we can... No, I think we are good to go. Switch off this, just keep it at this. So, good evening and good morning to all the participants who have joined in uh, for the second in series uh, Zero in Dialogue on Grid Interactive Net Zero Energy Buildings, uh, which uh, uh, with a focus, special focus on emerging technologies in this area. Um, this is a series that uh, we have initiated as part of uh, our US-India bilateral program called METRI or Market Transformation for Energy Efficiency. Uh, this is a new concept, uh, at least within India that we are, or within Asia that we are trying to promote through a couple of interventions. One of course being proving things on ground through uh, actual deployment projects where we are uh, supporting the design and construction of grid interactive net zero energy buildings, uh, particularly uh, with examples in Telangana, in Chhattisgarh, and so on. But the second part of uh, you know this whole promotion or seeding in this new concept of grid interactive net zero energy buildings is also how do we promote and propagate the thought of how buildings and grids can actually be seen in a combination and buildings are not just seen as key drivers of uh, creating more energy demand but also as a possible solution uh, to the challenge uh, that the grid faces by offering flexibility and uh, to the grid and so basically <clears throat> combining the concept of taking the buildings to another level and seeing it as a part of the solution for a smarter grid rather than as a challenge so far. That's how the, uh, the two sectors have been seen as, but this is like a convergence of <clears throat> two areas for a better and a smarter grid. So, uh, <coughs> sorry, today we have this on our agenda. The first series, were, first dialogue uh, last week was focused more around the concept and and in general talked about policies, technologies and other things. But this particular today's uh, focus would be all around technology. And uh, but we will start with just an introduction to this zero in dialogue, uh, which I will be doing, which is um, uh, what I just started. And the second would be. This would be followed by understanding the grid interactive net zero energy buildings by Nithi, who's part of the EDS team, which is implementing the USAID METRI program. Then we have uh, John Smith Sreen, who is the director of the Indo Pacific office in USAID India, who will be giving his keynote address, followed by uh, specific uh, technology experts uh, from uh, the utility perspective, from the smart cities perspective for uh, you know, um, innovations in technology for uh, energy optimization in buildings. And then last, last but not the least, we would have the smart grids for smart buildings uh, by the National Smart Grid Mission uh, senior official, Mr. Atul Bali. And, and then we'll have a Q&A session. So that's the agenda for today. And without much ado, uh, we'll just start off. Uh, so these are the speakers uh, that uh, we have today. Uh, I'll be introducing each of the speaker as they present, and uh, with that, uh, let's just get on to the real work today, which is focusing or discussing the emerging technologies uh, for the grid interactive net zero energy buildings. Uh, Nidhi, would you like to take forward now uh, this whole concept on the grid interactive buildings? Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I hope I'm audible. I'm going to share a short presentation, basically covering three aspects. What are grid interactive net zero energy buildings and what makes them different from net zero energy buildings? What are the characteristics of GNZs and the symbiotic relationships they share with the transmission and the distribution network? And a short overview on the developments that have been happening across the world on this subject. So this we know. Right, net zero energy buildings are highly efficient buildings with extremely low energy demand, which is met by renewable energy sources. Over a year, they produce as much as in as much energy as they can consume. Um, 
So taking a step back, here is an example of an office building in central India. And what we see here is a load profile for an entire year. And we can see some seasonal variations, right, on the load variations. Zooming down into the hourly load profile for over a week, we notice that the building has 50% occupancy possibly on a Saturday and, you know, it doesn't even operate on a Sunday. Taking this further into a daily profile, we start seeing morning peaks, right, a sharp morning peaks. And this one has two smaller peaks throughout the day, you know, based on the how the building is operated. Now, what if this building was to work as a net zero energy building? That would mean that there would be a renewable energy component, right? So in this case, sort of solar photovoltaics would offset the amount of energy the building consumes over a period of a year. But we also know that the solar output is not consistent throughout the year. And even though the building may achieve a net zero energy at the end of the year, there will be certain months, like say in the monsoons, where it is taking more from the grid than it is supplying back to. And in some months, it would be vice versa. There would be a surplus. So if we looked at this onto the daily profile, right, uh, it gets even more com complex. In a real life scenario, we rarely see a smooth curve, you know, especially on cases of cloudy days. The building's own load demand on the grid keeps going up and down and it causes issue on the grid. Looking at this in a weekly profile, the most obvious and sensible solution would be to push back the electricity into the grid over the weekends, right? Because that's when you would have abundant supply and which is not getting consumed. Now, this would be okay if we had, say, one building, two buildings on a feeder. But what if every building does this in isolation and starts pushing electricity back into the grids at its own convenience? Logically, it seems like a huge problem. So if we pause and we look at from a utility lens, right, where challenges are mainly governed around rising peak demands and the requirements of additional infrastructure to support this. In addition to the seasonal peaks demands that are being experienced, we now face a scenario where you see multiple peaks, you know, within the same day. And if we truly want a resilient grid network and, you know, reduce it, the burden on it, the buildings need to contribute towards shaving these peaks, right, and flattening this curve. In this slide, if you look at scaling net zero energy buildings, which have an inward looking approach, governed by self-consumption, it is not really an integrated solution. These buildings need to evolve, addressing both high performance in terms of energy efficiency and provide demand flexibility that enables us to flatten the load curve. So first and foremost, it comes down to efficiency. Then we move on to load sharing, where we can drop off certain load where we don't need it, or we'll shift certain loads on the times that it is required. I mean, it can be moved into from midday to morning, things of that sort. And lastly, load modulation that looks at the ability to provide voltage stability and contributes to improved power quality. So what would it mean for a grid interactive net zero energy building? It means efficiency first and foremost, right? Next, generation. As if generation so that our building is profitable. And then moving, the moving to shifting or shedding of load profiles to start taking advantage of dynamic pricing from the tariffs perspective, right? So the key characteristics of grid interactive net zero buildings, net zero energy buildings would be uh, starting with efficiency, lowering energy demand through passive, through super efficient, low energy cooling systems. Next, establishing a two-way connection with the grid, with IoT, smart meters coming in play. You know, the, I, the benefit of having a connection is that the building now will start to understand what status structures would look like when we start moving towards real-time pricing. And then this is supported by the building being smart, right? With the, uh, with the understanding of consumer analytics, consumer needs, energy flows, patterns, and lastly, you know, the flexibility that we, it can offer to reduce, to shift, to generate loads based on the signals that it receives. 
So in a nutshell, grid interactive net zero energy buildings are highly efficient grid connected buildings that meet the energy demand through renewable means while maintaining a two-way communication with the grid to balance demand and electricity supply. It has all these elements that you see, uh, measurement systems, sensors, AIs, controls that take into account uncertainties and weather patterns, managing building loads, generation, storage, even newer loads that we are getting added, that are getting added into our network, like the EVs. So um, with COP26, uh, we have net zero pledges taking a forefront now. Our countries across the globe have been working on two fronts. One is embracing net zero energy or carbon targets for the building sector. And second is transitioning to a decarbonized, decentralized digitization of the grid, right? Before we had separate targets for buildings, um, one for separate for buildings, another separate for the grid. But for a true net zero emission future, the buildings and the grid dialogue needs to converge. Grid interactive net zero energy buildings is that dialogue, right? We see across the globe, there's been work done by many international national entities which are moving this concept to reality, um, be it through establishing definitions, developing standards, developing rating systems, guidebooks, frameworks, labeling programs even for demand-ready appliances, developing economic models, testing them on pilots, running utility programs, it's endless. This is no way a comprehensive list, but it talks to the importance of the subject. Lastly, I would end by saying that, you know, grid interactive net zero energy buildings are a pillar for a clean, clean energy transition. And they're a key node for the smart grid of, our fut of the future. But it doesn't mean that we have to wait for smart grid to be 100% ready for us to integrate buildings into this network. It is time for buildings to take the next step in the evolution and be grid ready. Thank you. Over to you, Apurva. Thank you, Nidhi. That was a very, very comprehensive uh, description or explanation of what a grid interactive net zero energy building means. And particularly since we are starting that narrative for India, as well as for all the emerging economies where this hasn't happened, I think this was uh, really put in very well. And this dialogue series, as you uh, rightly mentioned, is, is basically uh, going to focus on how the policies, which have been pretty siloed in terms of a policy on buildings, a policy on utilities, uh, on smart grids, uh, renewables, they have been talked about in, in silos. They never have converged. How do we bring this, uh, use the medium of uh, grid interactive net zero energy buildings as a convergence of policies across the sectors? Also, you know, then uh, kind of develop new business models where it is beneficial. For all, beneficial for all stakeholders, right from the building uh, owners and operators and consumers to the utilities, as well as, uh, you know, to the grid operators, uh, you know, all uh, kind of become, and as well as the environment. So all become a part of this convergence. And then how do we enhance uh, consumer behavior, uh, consumer engagement through appropriate consumer behavior? through this dialogue. So those are all the focus areas that we would be undertaking as part of the Zero In Dialogue as we move forward in the next month on this. So uh, thank you, Nidhi. And with that, I will now request John Smith Sreen, uh, who is the, uh, who's a very senior foreign service officer of the US government, joined uh, the USAID India uh, post as director for the Indo-Pacific Caucus within USAID India and looking after the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, just in October, but by no means he's uh, new to India. Uh, I always say, I mean, John is an institutional memory in terms of uh, uh, doing a lot of work and particularly also on the green building movement that USA did help and support, not only with the government of India, but with state governments and also the market transformation for green building is something that John has been part of that uh, journey in fact, initiated quite a bit uh, early in 2000s when he was here in his earlier position as part of the energy team uh, with USAID India. Uh, he's, of course, uh, served almost on in 
many missions within uh, South Asia. His uh, last position was in Bangladesh, where he headed the economic uh, and energy uh, office there, but he's also served in Sri Lanka, Afghanistan, Pakistan. Uh, so he knows the South Asia and the Asia landscape very well. Uh, uh, with that, I'll request John over to you. Thanks very much, uh, Purva. Uh, colleagues, I, I really wanted to just spend a few minutes with you this afternoon sharing some more high level views from my organization, uh, USAID and more broadly, our bilateral cooperation between the United States and, and India. I'm really looking forward to hearing more of the views from our partners and, and the assembled uh, experts. Uh, uh, Purva mentioned uh, Atul Bali from the National Smart Grid Mission, and we have Mona Chandra from Distributed Energy Resources and Amrita Chowdhury from Gaia Smart Cities and Arjun Gupta from Smart Jewels. And we've just heard, of course, uh, from our partners from uh, Maitri Nidhi Gupta, and we'll be hearing a bit later from Tanme uh, Tathagat. So really looking forward to, to the dialogue. I, I think these Zero in dialogues are just a great opportunity for all of us to kick around a, a few ideas and um, really focus in on specific aspects of the energy efficiency uh, paradigm. And as Nidhi said, it, it's about embracing and transitioning. So that's what I'd like to, to focus on also. But I'll, I'll first start uh, with the President of the United States, uh, President Joe Biden. Um, it was literally within hours after taking office last January that President Biden signed uh, an executive order recommitting the United States to um, what he defined as climate uh, action and cooperation uh, globally to address global climate change. And this was really important for, for many reasons. Um, certainly for somebody like me, um, as a Purva said, I had the distinct pleasure of working on these issues um, between 15 and 20 years ago in, in my first USAID posting, which was in India. So. Um, it's wonderful, it's intriguing uh, to see the scope and scale of the progress uh, here in India over these many years. It's not surprising, uh, however, because uh, India, as you all know, is such a, a wonderful country full of uh, opportunity and dynamism and, and creativity. And the, the changes in technology here in India uh, over those 20 years and the changes in technologies in the United States and, and worldwide um, are, are quite, quite dramatic. Um, I recall sitting in a seminar uh, put on by the World Bank when I first joined um, USAID and uh, people were lamenting about uh, solar energy and the high costs of solar energy and how solar panels would break down. Well, the equation has changed dramatically and uh, the cost for solar energy has plummeted, making it very, very attractive uh, and very, very cost effective and uh, solar panels are much more reliable. So that was just 20 years ago in the, in the course of my career with USAID. Um, the technology all across the board in the energy sector is evolving rapidly. And there's a lot that's happening here in India, a lot of creativity in terms of developing that, that technology. And of course, in my own country in the United States. So President Biden's focus on global climate change, as I said, recommitted the United States to uh, the Paris Agreement, uh, an agreement that actually the US um, helped design under President Barack Obama 
Um, and now we're we're back into it, um, working very, very closely with many countries, uh, including with India. And last April, uh, President Biden hosted um, what he called the, the Climate Leaders Summit. And in that summit, Prime Minister Modi and President Biden launched what is called the, the US uh, India uh, Climate and Clean Energy uh, 2030 Agenda Partnership. It's, it's quite a mouthful, um, too many words, I, I think, in it, but it, it recommitted both of our countries um, to really focusing and reinvigorating some of the constructs that already existed and put forward some new constructs. So the one that already existed was the Strategic Clean Energy Partnership, um, but new life has been breathed into that partnership. And we formed a new uh, consortium uh, uh, led by um, representatives from both governments uh, called the Climate Action and Finance Mobilization Dialogue. So now under this new partnership, there are two tracks, multiple pillars and, and working groups, all um, focus on addressing different aspects of mitigating climate change and promoting clean and renewable energy and energy efficiency. For us in USAID India, um, it was wonderful because we could breathe more easily. We'd actually been working for many years uh, on these types of issues, despite the ongoing uh, policy turbulations in, in Washington. Um, we, we kept focusing uh, on activities that made good sense for development uh, in India and more broadly in, in South Asia. So um, Maitri is one of those activities, uh, meaning partnership in, in Hindi. Uh, and um, the, the term Maitri, uh, of course, is market integration and transformation for, for energy efficiency, but it's much more. Uh, that whole concept of partnership um, is really a beautiful concept and is something that USAID stands behind very strongly. It's a partnership model that brings together government, private sector, civil society, all of us working together with a recognition that no one individual, no one institution has sufficient resources, has a monopoly on good ideas or good technologies. But by working together, um, we can really change the paradigm in, in terms of uh, clean energy, renewable energy, energy uh, efficiency. So that's, that's really what we've been promoting. All of this fits under what is now called the uh, Indo-Pacific Strategy which focuses on three broad objectives, good governance, uh, uh, improved management uh, and resilience of natural resources and sustainable and inclusive economic growth. Now, where does energy efficiency um, fit into all of these? It actually transcends, in my opinion, all three pillars of the Indo-Pacific strategy. Um, you've obviously, obviously got a lot of governance that uh, will guide and shape um, the implementation of programs and technologies. The improved and more resilient management of natural resources, well, there, there are clearly environmental impacts associated with um, promoting greater uh, energy efficiency. And the, the sustainable and inclusive economic growth, um, the more energy we can save, um, we, can, we can do more with the resources that we have. So uh, back to Nidhi's point on embracing. That's why we've continued over the years to embrace 
uh, energy efficiency because it's just making smarter use of the resources that we have available. It also allows us a bit more time and positions countries like India and the United States to transition toward uh, uh, a future that will be really relying much more on renewable energy. Today, both countries still get the majority of their power from thermal sources. But as we all know, um, India has new targets that have been declared uh, during COP26, 500 gigawatts of renewable energy by, by 2030, and uh, half of the country's power derived from renewable energy sources by, by 2030. Uh, the net zero target for overall for the country by, by 2070. So ambitious targets and these constructs that I referred to in the beginning under uh, the India-US Climate and Clean Energy Agenda Partnership for 2030, all will allow India to, to uh, meet those targets better. Um, and our focus in on energy efficiency will help that country transition um, toward meeting those, those targets. The transitioning part is um, quite, quite intriguing for us because um, it will allow all of us working together to, to craft a future that um, is brighter, uh, is more full of opportunity, is more productive, is cleaner um, for ourselves and for our children and our children's children. And now I'm talking about the citizens of India, the citizens of South Asia, the citizens of the United States, the, the citizens of the, the world. So by working together, we can craft that future that, that is better for all of us. Danyavad. Back to you, Aparva. Thank you, John, and Danyavad to you as well uh, for actually, uh, you know, taking us through that, you know, high-level high uh, engagement that you uh, both the governments the US government as well as the Indian government have and the commitment that they have to work together on clean energy and climate uh, you know agenda uh, so that both countries can, can benefit from the partnership and as you rightly pointed out Metri's name when we christian this name four years back uh, it was with a lot of thought that it means that we are going to bring in a lot of partnerships through this program and uh, Metri has lived up to its expectations with more than, you know, if I remember correctly, 20 to 30 partners which have, uh, which uh, with whom we work together on this project for the last four years. But now going forward, I'm sure with this whole uh, narrative around Grid Interactive, we would have newer partners to join in and older partners to converge together. Uh, but thank you, John, for not only laying the U.S.-India uh, uh, energy cooperation context and how energy efficiency has been an integral part of that uh, whole discussion and that whole strategy, uh, energy strategy between the or cooperation between the two countries, and now how energy efficiency coupled with a smarter, you, uh, you know, smarter grid uh, would have uh, would actually take us near towards or contribute towards the net zero emissions that the two countries are committed to. So with that, uh, uh, I'll now move on to the next on the agenda, which is uh, basically uh, requesting Mona Chandra from the Distributed Energy Resources National Grid uh, to talk about demand management and distributed energy resources from a utility perspective. I think uh, that is a, a, a very significant uh, uh, I would say, uh, uh, you know, um, narrative that needs to be told. And therefore, we thought, Mona, you would be uh, the most, uh, I mean, uh, a very uh, important uh, uh, key stakeholder in this uh, discussion and dialogue. Mona is an architect. She's also a strategist. She specializes in energy efficiency and smart technologies. Uh, and uh, she's actually responsible for developing uh, transition strategy to move consumers towards net zero by 2050. So a very uh, you know, important stakeholder in this whole net zero emission and moving towards net zero transition. 
uh, it will be very interesting to hear from you, uh, Mona, uh, uh, your uh, perspective from the utility side. Over to you, Mona. Thank you so much. And thank you for everyone for joining. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity. Um, so I just wanna share what work we have done in the past few years uh, at National Grid, which is a utility in the Northeast of the United States. We are an uh, investor owned utility. We are also regulated. Um, we serve about 20 million customers in the Northeast that includes Massachusetts, New York, and Rhode Island. We are a transmission and distribution utility, so we don't generate and we are coupled, decoupled from generation. So um, what I'm really gonna share is some of the program work that we've done in the past few years and past five years related to electric demand response and uh, you know where what we did to begin with and where we are today. Uh, so just sharing a brief experience that we've had um, so just some context, this is really speaking about demand response, electric demand response in Massachusetts. Uh, you know, Massachusetts, in Massachusetts, National Grid serves about, um, you know, approximately 2 million, uh, over 2 million residential customers and, uh, you know, about 3% of that are commercial customers. So this is really sharing the demand response program that we launched in 2016 in, in Massachusetts. So just a little bit about the background, the regulated framework that we have and, you know, how the system is operated. Um, in Massachusetts, we have a, um, an, a law, which is the Green Communities Act, under which utilities and other program administrators are asked to implement energy efficiency programs and demand resp uh, response programs. Um, in the most cost effective uh, way, which is basically to say that um, the benefits should outweigh the costs. Um, and typically, uh, program administrators and utilities um, will file a, a plan with uh, the Public Utilities Commission for approval of budgets and targets, which are associated with reduction of um, either, you know, both um, electricity and gas. And so for this de demand response program that we launched in 2016 in Massachusetts, we had done a filing and filed for a de demonstration program. Uh, in, in Massachusetts, we are part of the ISO New England. So we have an in independent system operator, which is responsible for grid operations, as well as the market administration and the power system planning. And um, one of the other things I want to sort of point out about uh, Massachusetts is that we don't really have smart grid penetration. So we don't really have to use rates for our uh, residential customers. For some of our larger commercial customers, really small subset of them, we do have a sort of a sub metering and they do have uh, more like the time of use rates. So as you can see on the graph on the right, you really what you're seeing is the ISO New England annual system load. And we are a summer peaking system. And uh, we see our summer peak between, you know, July and September. Uh, and so uh, the idea of the demand response program was really to curtail the peak load on the system. And uh, we really looked at both residential and commercial solutions to reduce that peak load. Um, the reason is A, the fuel that's used during those peak hours tends to be dirtier, as you can see in the graph above. You know, while our mix is predominantly natural gas, uh, renewables, and uh, nuclear, during those peak times, we do tend to use dirtier fuels like oil and coal. So the idea for the demand response program was twofold. One was to really look at it from an environmental standpoint, but the other is around costs. The cost of energy during these peak times tends to be much higher. And so in 2015, we filed with the PUC for a big demonstration program uh, for commercial and uh, residential customers. And um, you know, in 2016, we launched the program with uh, for residential customers with Wi-Fi thermostats, 
Uh, we thought at that time it was important as the market transformed and we got more Wi-Fi thermostats into the market and other enabled devices into the market that we would enroll them into our programs as an opportunity to reduce uh, peak load. In 2017, we launched our um, commercial uh, and industrial program, which really looked at curtailment with large commercial industrial customers. This is a program which is sort of technology agnostic. You, really don't, you, know, you can bring any sort of load reduction by any means and you could participate in our programs. The programs basically provide you with an incentive uh, for enrolling and um, for the residential program as you enroll your, your device into the program, there's an incentive and then ongoing every year, there is an incentive for performing during peak events. Um, so the, the, the connected, connected Solutions is really the name of our demand response program in 2016 through 17 really looked like this. We began our program with um, three on the residential side, it was a direct load control program. We launched it with three partnerships with Wi-Fi ma manufacturers, Nest, Ecobee, and Honeywell. Um, at that time, we were more focused on, um, you know, we actually developed our own demand response management software platform so that we could engage customers and enroll them into our programs and have a continuous engagement platform. And then uh, on the commercial and industrial side, the way the program runs is we have curtailment service providers who, who, who actually uh, reach out to customers for load reduction. And um, we, we look at uh, calling events and you can see the reduction in load. Typically the targeted dispatch, the commercial program, you have about like five events in a year. So it is a pretty uh, you know, small uh, window of, of events while on the residential side, you know, you're looking at a lot more events. In 2016, 17 timeframe, you know, we had about a thousand devices enrolled in the program with a reduction of like 1.4 megawatts. With a targeted dispatch program, we had about 15.1 megawatt reduction that we, that we saw. Um, and that program, I just wanted to sort of point out, you know, has really sort of evolved and I can share that uh, in, in what we're doing now in 22. Some of the key factors, you know, about what we were trying to test with, um, with the residential program was to really see how much load would a customer reduce, you know, what was the drivers for um, customer participation. We tested the messaging of our program as well. And so here you can see some of the results that we sort of uh, learned from that first year. And the programs have definitely evolved. And so, you know, one of the key learnings on for, for us at that, you know, launching it a year in uh, was that while the technology is something that you can work through, um, the key aspect is really customer engagement and the partnerships that you need to develop to launch some of these programs. And so, uh, you know, while I, while I was looking at uh, you know, the, the um, conference sort of title, which sort of says, how can technology integration in buildings be part of the solution? I think one of the key aspects that we learned is that if you want a successful solution around um, whether it's energy efficiency or any sort of uh, peak reduction programs, it's really around how do you motivate customers to change their behavior. And they really are a key part of that uh, uh, sort of process. Um, in 2021, 22, where are we right now? You know, we have about, uh, for Wi-Fi thermostats, we have about uh, eight uh, um, Wi-Fi manufacturers that are part of our programs now. Uh, as in, you know, if you have a thermostat which uh, is manufactured by these, by Fed thermostat manufacturers, you can enroll them into our programs. We launched uh, battery inverters in 2019. Uh, this year, we launched uh, an EV program. So you can actually have uh, um, enroll your vehicles into our demand response program. Uh, next year, we are looking at uh, chargers, vehicle chargers as a, uh, as a participant. 
Um, we do have solar inverters um, and uh, pool pumps are coming next year. So, so this is sort of the range on the residential side that you see. And then on the curtailment side, we launched uh, 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 another program, which is the daily dispatch program uh, in 2020. And we have a lot more partners who have, um, you know, the curtailment service providers who are enrolled in our programs now. And where we stand in terms of, um, you know, the growth of the programs, you know, it seems like really significant, right? We started off with about a thousand devices and currently in Massachusetts, we are somewhere around 23,000 devices. Um, but if you look at it from a perspective of, you know, the market share, it's still fairly small. And one of the biggest challenges really is being able to engage with customers and figuring out a way for them to participate in the programs. Uh, I would say it's similar on the, um, you know, on the commercial and industrial side, you know, we do have certain limitations on how much a customer can, uh, can uh, reduce load. So that sort of is the limitation uh, in, around that program. Um, what's next for National Grid? You know, we are currently working on gas demand response in New York. Um, we are looking at more targeted uh, um, uh, DR, both on the gas and electric side, because the problem we were trying to solve initially was around reducing peak load on the ISO New England system. And what we are finding is that we have more localized constraints um, that are emerging um, on the peak day and peak hour, both on the gas distribution network as well as the electric distribution network. So really looking at geo-targeting our pr programs uh, moving forward. And with that, I'd like to just hand it back to, um, back to you. Uh, thank you so much, Mona. I think that was a great insight on uh, from a utility perspective, how these uh, demand management and distributed energy resources how, how, how do they function at a utility level? How do you manage them? So uh, that was a, a very thorough insight in, from the experience that you have at National Grid. Uh, with that, I would now move on to uh, 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 the next presentation, which is on IoT for interconnected uh, intelligence in grid interactive buildings and smart cities, which will be presented by Amrita Chaudhary, who's the founder and uh, who's the co-founder of the Gaia Smart Cities. Uh, again, Amrita is, uh, is a business strategist. She's an engineer plus also an innovator. And uh, she's worked in several capacities and has, has several uh, patents on her name uh, for semiconductor manufacturing. And she served with a lot of, uh, you know, as an independent director on several boards, including Simons Marshall, Nesco, Mahindra Life Spaces. I mean, uh, the list is endless actually. Uh, but just to give a perspective, Gaia uh, provides solutions for smart cities and uh, it kind of blends IoT, ICT, artificial intelligence, machine learning and analytics to provide insights. Uh, so I think it's very important to hear Amrita from that perspective. Over to you, Amrita. Uh, thank you so much, Apurva, and delighted to be here. So uh, let me just uh, share a little bit of like, you know, like, uh, um, you know, perspective both from the buildings, but also like, you know, the smart city and the larger macro, uh, like, you know, framework that we have. And very, very interesting, like, in you know, a dialogue, uh, first of all, like, and I must uh, say, uh, both today and uh, the earlier session that you had. So, uh, you know, let's uh, dig into the challenge a little bit before we talk about what's been happening in India and what's like, you know, the future opportunity potential. So, uh, you know, at a very macro level, like, you know, there are major drivers, uh, like, you know, that are impacting the demand side of electricity. So obviously population has increased, there is increased elect electrification, which we talked about in the last uh, uh, session that you did. Urbanization and a lot of like, you know, movement away from um, small towns and um, rural areas into urban centers is happening. Industrialization is happening. And agriculture is also automating, right? So there's a lot of tech 
coming in that side. Plus, with rising income, there's been a lot more consumption. There's been a lot more of uh, equipment, appliances, uh, including air conditioning in buildings, in homes, and so on. And all of that is really leading to this demand rise. And if you see, like, another you know, demand really has been rising significantly like you know for the last uh, several years and what's interesting is like you know if we uh, start looking at some of these uh, uh, you know the patterns for the future and the projections uh, we see that the demand is not just rising but we are seeing the kind of like you know like uh, peaks the daily peaks that uh, you know uh, some of the earlier speakers were mentioning at a city and at a country level right like you know and um, this really is going to create more challenges because they like, can you know, how do you manage all of these uh like you know different appliances people buildings uh transport hubs and all of them like you know all connected at the same time and peaking at the same time right so there's a lot of management that needs to be done so if you look at it, uh smart cities obviously the whole idea is how do you build in a lot of technology into uh, optimizing these cities into like you know like uh, and in India for sure like you know there's been a lot of focus on uh, utilities and basic uh, provision of infrastructure with the addition and inclusion of technology so that it becomes like you know measurable um, uh, it's monitored and like you know with the view of improving over time but it's not just smart cities, right? So we talk about the cities, but there are uh, 4,041 urban local bodies. These are the tier two, tier three cities, as we call them in India, the towns. There are 600,000 plus villages. Uh, we have the national um, infrastructure, uh, like in a, a, a corridor, like, you know, like, uh, which is uh, coming up. happening in ports, rail, metro, roads, airports. And all of these have many kinds of projects which are related to uh, not just power, but related to water, solid waste management, transport, safety, security, environment monitoring. All of these require a lot of smart devices. And while it is good that we know that we can measure and monitor like you know, how each of these separate components are working, it's really increasing the load and the demand for electricity, right? Uh, in general, like, you know, obviously cities consume 70% of global energy and, uh, but it's not just from buildings, right? Uh, I mean, there is the power and energy, uh, like, you know, part of it, and there are the buildings for domestic and commercial real estate, but there is transport, there's logistics, uh, increasingly, like, you know, the whole EV uh, infrastructure that is being, um, like, you know, like, uh, implemented and will be implemented uh, in great force over the next decade. Uh, there are transport hubs, railway stations, airports, and so on. And then there are city infrastructure, like you know, street lighting, uh, traffic management system, uh, the automated traffic control systems, the CCTV and surveillance systems. So there's a lot of systems that are being implemented in the cities, all of which are consuming uh, electricity. And then there is the whole, like, you know, like uh, water waste management, all of these areas, again, which are huge consumers of electricity at the city level. If we look at the major usage, Right. I mean, uh, obviously, buildings uh, are a large component, but industry and transport are some of the other net major consumers of electricity. And if we see how that's changing, like in you know, a projected change, obviously, buildings and industry are like you know, projected to consume a lot more energy uh, going forward. Right. And again, if we look down further, uh, breaking it down, uh, it's not just industry and like, you know, there's an agri com component, but like, you know, within buildings, you have domestic and commercial buildings, railways. And because it's uh, like, you know, one entity largely like you know, Indian railways, there is a lot of uh, like, you know, consumption that they are uh, doing and they are also uh, like, you know, going through electrification. So again, that load is supposed to increase and they are also like you know, seeing what they can do to contribute to this um you know reduction in the demand uh going forward and within industry of course like you know there are certain industries that consume a lot more and um again like you know what's interesting is that the larger players uh which tend to have like you know more automation more sort of digital transformation of the factory of the equipment and so on are lower consumers but the smaller players in each sector are higher consumers of electricity just because they don't have the automation or they don't have the equipment which is more energy efficient and so on.
right? So there is a whole spectrum of users out there. And then again, like, you know, looking down at the building level, it's not just about the consumption, but there's a lot of like, you know, loss, leakage, wastage. A lot of buildings obviously are designed at peak capacity, but then like, you know, like uh, the usage at any given point of time might be like, you know, 50%, 60%. What can we do to optimize that in real time? And uh, like, you know, those are all of the questions. And again, the major considerations over there are the HVAC, the uh, cooling systems, and um, like you know the lighting systems. And I know like you know, Amartya Sen had um, jokingly said a couple of years back, like and I was at an event and I was hearing him speak, and he was talking about how if uh, you know all the commercial buildings and the hotels in India just uh, reduced or like you know, increased their temperature setting by one degree or maybe two degrees because they're all at 18 or 19 degrees is the preset temperature in a hotel or in a commercial building. If they increase it by one or two degrees, we could really like, you know, like, uh, uh, reduce the demand of electricity so much and like, you know, become a lot more like uh, positive in terms of, uh, the availability of, uh, supply. Right. So what really are the imperatives both for buildings and for cities, uh, two, one is how do you decrease local consumption? So a lot, of, a lot of optimization, monitoring and automation at different levels. And the other one is increasing local generation. So there has been a lot of like, you know, mandates, not all uh, like, you know, are already, um, I mean, while the mandates are there, it's uh, not fully implemented. So for example, solar rooftop, there was a, uh, there is a mandate that at least like, you know, 80% of all government buildings should have solar rooftop and like, you know, majority of their um, energy should come from like, you know, solar rooftop but not like, you know, it hasn't fully been implemented as yet. Uh, some of the things that I'll talk about a little bit more are like, you know, like the PV, uh, solar PV plants, like, you know, the other non-renewable plants, uh, bio waste, waste to energy plants and so on, which are all part of the smart city and uh, like, you know, like uh, ecosystem. But if we look at technology, like, you know, if you go down to technology, like, you know, there are many technologies at every a uh, bit from the regulatory and policy side to create like, you know, the, um, a demand uh, led marketplace, uh, so to speak, and allowing uh, retail consumers to also connect to the grid, uh, which is like, you know, probably eventually like you know, a, a dream and a goal. Uh, but in the immediate term, like, you know, can we get uh, at least like, you know, some of the waste to energy plants and some of the sewage treatment plants and so on, like, you know, like uh, uh, the buildings, the large commercial buildings, government buildings connected to the grid and uh, be like, you know, not just consumers, but also like, you know, prosumers. Uh, there's a lot of like, you know, preventive maintenance through the smart uh, transmission and distribution that is possible, which really, again, reduces uh, the loss on uh, like, you know, like uh, loss and leakage through the system. And, uh, you know, the interesting part is that, uh, you know, uh, the earlier speaker was talking about dirty power. So anytime there is um, fault, it actually increases the uh, load and the demand on uh, dirty power because the people who need to consume will probably like you know, end up consuming and they will just switch to alternate sources, which are not as efficient or as clean as uh, like you know, the uh, grid power might be. Um, and uh, like you know, uh, going further down, there's a lot more like you know, that can happen at the district level, uh, the optimizations at the district level, the optimizations at the city level, the AMI infrastructure, like you know, this is uh, increasingly being thought of at at least like you know, in Mumbai, uh, where I stay, um, they are changing the meters and making it uh, smart meters. So again, this is some uh, an effort that will continue over the next uh, several years to uh, convert the uh, regular meters that we have into uh, smart meters. And the minute you st start monitoring and measuring things and analyzing it, it actually like, you know, creates behavior change, right? So as consumers of uh, electricity, whether we are at the government or at the commercial end or at the residential end, the minute we start getting some information and analytics around what we are consuming, when we are consuming and how much it is costing us, is when we start taking corrective action, right? And uh, again, regulation is coming in. So some of the tariff structures, at least for the commercial uh, buildings are being changed from the pure, like, you know, like uh, wattage consumption to uh, looking at the peak load analysis and um, like, you know, the peak load that they've signed up for and so on and uh, creating uh, penalties around it, which again, like, you know, creates good behavior and creates the deterrence for uh, bad behavior. Right. And then finally, at the end of it, are the smart buildings. And if you look at, uh, you know, the technologies which can really reduce energy use in India, and um, I mean, uh, 
obviously it's looking at the carbon emissions perspective also so evs will be net consumers of electricity but all of the other things like you know all of our uh, we have a lot of legacy buildings which may need to be retrofitted uh, we're looking at uh, like you know solar electricity generation led lights including street lights and so on is a huge program across the country the next thing is obviously to make them uh, smart led lights so that you know that you can control the street lights uh, based on like in you know, a usage whether the road is occupied whether like you know uh, it's uh, uh, no one is passing through and so on so you can optimize it further uh, energy efficiency of appliances so there's been a lot of like you know like uh, uh, focus on the energy efficiency of lights increasingly of uh, domestic air, uh, conditioners fans not so much pumps yes or no so like you know different things and again like you know the more we pay attention to each one of these elements the more uh like you know the savings comes in right and uh at the bottom of uh, the list is again like you know some of the things that cities look at waste to energy uh, conversion uh water treatment biomethanation all of these are things that cities can contribute to so if you look at smart energy again like you know like there are many ways in which cities can contribute both from at the building level at the distribution at the city distribution level and how they connect back into the uh, substations and the equipment at uh, like you know like uh, um, beyond that and again at the building like you know there is a lot of uh, uh, ways in which we can look at uh, different kinds of IoT and analytics and sensors uh, to be inbuilt. And, you know, what we realize when we speak with customers or we visit buildings is that there's a lot of buildings with legacy BMS systems, which don't actually have this automation inbuilt. And hence, like, you know, there is a need for retrofitting. There is a need for, uh, like, you know, bringing in uh, plug and play solutions to look at some of these components. And like, you know, the newer uh, buildings are obviously coming in with more automation and more, uh, uh, you know, like uh, uh, controls. And there are guidelines from the government, from MOVA, from uh, Terry, uh, like, you know, on how to uh, look at the energy consumption of building design as we go into the future. So this is an example from Agra Smart City when we look at like, you know, a city-wide technology implementation and infratech Im implementation, there are many systems and subsystems that you're looking at in any given city, right? Like, you know, so you're looking at your utilities, uh, you're looking at traffic, mobility, uh, different kinds of sen uh, sensors, intelligent buildings, uh, control and command rooms, and so on. Um, and like, you know, data centers. Now, data centers are huge consumers of electricity. And we are seeing like you know, the uh, uh, amount of data that has been generated by all of these and the roadmap for, uh, uh, you know, data center, uh, you know, PEs getting into data centers and a lot more data centers like, you know, coming up in the country in the future in the next, like, you know, uh, five to 10 years. So again, like, you know, these are areas where net electricity is consumed. And uh, what we are looking at today when we do the planning is, the point solutions right so we look at let's say the um, smart street lighting solution or we look at the intelligent building and control and command rooms with uh, captive uh, like you know power stations and like you know uh, optimization at that level but what we are not doing is really the modeling and forecasting of net increase in demand at each city level because of all of this instrumentation that we are putting in right and that is really like you know something that could be considered at uh, like you know to see how uh, energy efficiency and, and an energy lens can be brought into everything from every cctv camera that goes in or every uh, solid based uh, vehicle that like applies the roads and so on um, some of the other areas which are already underway where uh, cities are contributing to this whole like you know like uh, energy equation are the municipal energy efficiency programs so water as i mentioned like you know water utilities uh, consume a lot of electricity in the pumping and the distribution of uh, water in the uh, like you know recycling cleansing all of that so again like you know looking at upgrading some of those systems making them more energy efficient energy conscious monitoring uh, like you know seeing the patterns seeing when like you know like uh, they operate and uh, like you know like uh, um, hence like you know, reducing the load is one area 
clean energy through uh, solar and uh, like you know, non-renewables is something that we talked about. Public lighting, uh, both of uh, buildings and of uh, like you know, street lights is again like you know, a huge uh, area of focus for most cities. Through Swachh Bharat, there is another set of programs that are underway. If you look at uh, waste to energy uh, plants, biomethanation plants, again, uh, and uh, like you know, waste to water treatment plants. Now, uh, these can be both consumers of electricity and the waste to energy and the biomethanation can be net contributors like in you know, a back into the grid uh, by generating energy now uh while some of these you know one is that we are at an early stage in our life cycle of the implementation of these so uh, from the net potential of waste to energy or uh, uh, biomethanation plants and so on we are probably like in you know, a less than five percent uh of uh, installed capacity but even that like you know is facing some challenge because you know there are like you know at the bottom you see like you know all of these different ministries are involved in many ways in different parts of the power uh, dialogue so while a waste to energy plant or a bio uh, methanation plant might come under a uh, you know a municipal body and a municipality governed by the ministry of housing and urban affairs it's also like in you know, a linked with the ministry of renewable energies and like you know if you need to sell back or connect back to the grid then you need to know like you know what the linkages are what are the tariffs and so on so some of those like you know like are not as seamless as they need to be so again like you know like uh, there is conversations and uh, fits and starts but again a lot of dialogue and like you know like uh, uh, is needed and a lot of potential exists in each of these areas for future savings uh, this is an example again of uh, like you know something at the uh, transformer level at the distribution transformer level because again there are uh, disruptions for a variety of reasons like you know, it might be equipment for it it might be something else but it's leading to a service disruption for uh, consumers but consumers actually like you know switch over to dirty energy they switch over to gensets and fuel and the power generator or the power distributor is actually losing revenue for that particular period so how do you put in like you know intelligence how do you put in iot sensors can you get real time automation analytics reporting of that so that you know the fault detection is done in real time and the response is faster and hence like you know you are able to reduce the loss leakage or like you know like switch over to dirty energy so these are all like you know micro examples like you know of the uh, of the macro picture again at the intelligent uh, like in you know, a building level at least at the commercial and industrial building level like you know there is the whole area of energy but that is linked very closely with the whole operations and the people and the asset management that needs to happen in these kinds of establishments right and this is uh, these kinds of conversations are just beginning in commercial buildings in uh, like you know uh, industries in uh, railways because railways are doing a massive uh, digitalization uh, uh, program and like you know like uh, looking at energy consumption both traction side and non traction side so again these are conversations that are beginning now customers are still looking at roi they are still thinking like you know how do i improve but the minute you start monitoring this right like you, know, you start bringing it not just from one uh, floor one building and optimizations at the micro level but you bring it uh, across buildings across like in you know, a campus across like you know let's say um like you know like uh, a township level or even uh in, in the case of a railway at different hubs and stations and points you start getting a different view of it and you can start optimizing it at a different level right and uh the opportunity in this again is that there are many areas like you know like while there is lighting and, and energy management both uh, like you know the water systems the HVAC systems, security uh, systems, these are all net consumers of electricity in a building. And how can you make them more efficient so that you reduce the net uh, load of a building? And uh, there are many like you know, layers of this from uh, the application to the sensors to like you know, the uh, connectivity management and so on, which need to be optimized. And there is no single player out there who has the full stack and the full solution, right? And um, uh, whoever, uh, like you know, is moving in that direction, like you know, like uh, the larger BMS players, like you know, the building management systems players. If they are moving in that direction, the price is still prohibitive enough that customers are still saying, "Okay, what are my piecemeal solutions?" So uh, that creates an opportunity for startups. That creates an opportunity for other players. Uh, but again, like you know, the dialogue has started. A lot more needs to be done. And I think with that, I will just uh, end this. Uh, thank you so much.
<clears throat> thank you so much amrita i think you took us through the uh, you know entire journey of how what a smart city would constitute what kind of technology domains are part of that mix uh, what are the different areas of operation particularly on the iot and other aspects so thank you so much for that with that uh, i will now request arjun gupta who is the founder and ceo of smart jewels uh, arjun will present uh, on a case for innovations in technology for continuous energy optimization in buildings uh, just to give a kind of a, a overview of what smart jewels most of you probably would know but it's it's basically a energy efficiency company if i can say so with a mission really to en eliminate energy waste through innovations in continuous energy management and arjun um, uh, quite a few is quite well known he is one of the india's top young leaders uh, uh, you know in this uh, sector energy sector who's bring, i mean who's brought in substantial energy efficiency improvements across several of india's businesses and uh, you know uh, factories and organizations as the most uh, you know easiest and the quickest and the most scalable way to tackle energy equity and climate change so with that over to you arjun yeah thank you very much and good evening to everybody who joined in <clears throat> uh you know the previous speakers uh, gave a very good high level idea about uh, you know energy efficiency and uh, smart cities uh my talk today would be very very granular and go down into the minute details uh through an example of how uh energy efficiency can be achieved with iot uh, and also you know have some ideas about uh, how we can achieve great interactive uh you know capabilities of buildings so hopefully it'll be enlightening for some of the participants here um you know thanks for the introduction but uh, you know just a couple of slides about smart jewels we are saving we have saved 35% of the total energy consumption of all of these clients all across india uh, using intelligent energy management and largely through iot so uh, djewel is a technology platform that we developed uh, and we are using in all of our sites um, you know this is a complete iot platform uh, starting all the way from hardware so you know these are iot controllers that we design and build in house um these are installed on the sites so you can see these are control panels they are installed on the sites and then what they do is they stream data from the sites onto the cloud where we get very detailed insights into energy consumption so this is just a dashboard which which shows how much energy has been saved in this month in a particular site you know hourly consumption different patterns of consumption where the consumption is actually happening so uh, you know the platform the first thing it does is gives a very detailed minute by minute idea about where energy consumption is going so this in itself is a big leap from just getting a bill every month and wondering why it's so high um, here you can track you know pretty much the way we do it in and the facilities where we work is there are at least 50 plus smart energy meters and you can track equipment and system level energy consumption uh, and, you know this and this information is used in multiple ways uh, uh, which you know you'll see in a little bit as we go along so uh, here uh, you know this is just a building load pattern so as i mentioned every minute we know the consumption of uh, the building so you know if you want to know all the last you know five weeks on monday what has been the load pattern it's click away and then you can go very deep into this and see where it's coming from as well so imagine a utility uh, which is looking you know like national grid was presenting earlier you know let's say a utility is curious to know uh, what is the potential in any particular building for demand response and where it can come from uh, you know one doesn't need to do a month long or a year long exercise you just go and click a few buttons and then you'll be able to know what can be the potential impact from this particular building and how can we achieve it so that was something simple uh, you know the platform goes much deeper uh, you know the, the, the real key to energy optimization and controls at the end of the day uh, when you say grid interactive my understanding is that there needs to be a two way communication right uh, interaction means there need to be some controls involved so uh, if you want to control something you need to understand 
how it's functioning and what are the impacts uh, of any changes to its operations likely to be. Uh, so here is a uh, you know, simple dashboard which shows all the parameters that are important for a chiller and the chiller is the largest energy consumer in any commercial building. Uh, so all the relevant parameters and again, just like energy consumption, every single parameter is logged uh, every minute. And you know you can review the history, and that historical data is also utilized to figure out how it might behave in different certain conditions. So you know this is a chiller kind of dashboard. You know, some interesting features out here that you know we we draw the users. So what we try to do with that IoT systems is to make it useful uh, for the operations and maintenance people. And one simple way to make it useful is to color code things which are kind of off. Track. So here you can see, you know, that the thing is operating manually. When it operates manually, it's not efficient. So somebody who's looking at the dashboard can see, oh, you know, this equipment is something's wrong over here. Something needs to be done. Uh, condenser inlet temperatures beyond the threshold value, and you know, it's 32 degrees, and it's not supposed to be this high. So it's in red, and then there's an alarm, and so you click on it, it'll tell you what's going on, what you need to do to fix it. So. You know, these are simple things again, but I'm coming to the great interactive and the interesting parts very soon. So, uh, you know, we talk about controls now. So this chiller, for example, you know, that I just showed you can be controlled in two ways. Uh, one is just somebody goes, you know, like your old BMS and uh, presses a button to turn it on or off or to change the set point. Uh, and then the other, uh, the other way that we are, we are doing it is something that we call June recipes. And this is the tool that I'd like to introduce today as, as something that I believe has a lot of power to enable a, a great interactive, uh, truly great interactive future. Uh, and you know, something that is ready today. So, uh, you know, what it is is Joul recipe. Uh, we created this concept Joul recipe is basically any kind of logic that helps uh, save energy. So now it has evolved into a generic web-based tool, uh, which, can configure any alert or take any action automatically on any equipment that is connected to our IoT system. Uh, when any set of specified conditions become true, so automatically take actions uh, in terms of alerts or start stop or changing speeds, etc. When any set of specified conditions become true, and these conditions can be specified by any analyst, anybody who knows how to use Google or Facebook, you know, it's so simple the user interface. Uh, these conditions can be specified for any period of time, okay, and they can be based on any parameter or any combination of parameters, uh, and they can be real-time uh, historical data or any other source of data. They don't even need to be the data that is already stored in the IoT platform. They can take in data from anywhere, uh, and you know the conditions can uh, be based on any single logic or a combination of logic. So. Uh, you know, simple way of saying this, it, it, this gives you ultimate flexibility to control any equipment uh, based on any logic or combination of logics that you can think of. And you can do all of this uh, just by uh, using any device. Uh, you know, it doesn't need to be, uh, the, the, the program doesn't need to be written into any controller that is uh, actually installed on any site. Uh, the, the entire logic lives on the cloud. Uh, to which every facility and every equipment is connected. So what it does is it, it, it allows for speed and flexibility. So, it, you know, today, if you wake up with a with new idea to control all your connected assets across all your sites, it won't take you multiple hours and days to actually implement it. Uh, it'll take you a few seconds. So I'm going to give some examples of this, uh, you know, Joule recipes, uh, there are many types. Uh, we, we've kind of classified them uh, with our experience on things that are useful, you know, alerts that are useful, types of alerts. So, you know, maintenance types of alerts, warnings, comfort, consumption and demand, run hour violations, and then certain actions that are typically taken in buildings to save energy. Uh, you know, uh, how do you want to use your chiller? So, multi you know, ultimately there's multiple equipment, uh, more than you need always installed on a site. So, which ones do you want to use and what combinations? Uh, those are kind of actions that you can take through Joule recipes, uh, you know, set point changes. Uh, so I'm going to get into some examples. So here's an example, uh, you know, I'm going to focus on this method of what is being controlled 
uh, based on what input and, and what is the outcome generated. These are all real examples from real buildings located right here in India. So here control parameters are frequency. So how, you know, how much water is being uh, delivered by a chilled water pump. And, uh, you know, well, out of all the pumps that are out there, how many are on and off. So these, these things are being controlled, right? Which chilled water pump is on and how much water should it be delivering? These, these parameters are automatically controlled. So you can see in this graph, you know, the over multiple days, what is the pattern of the flow? Uh, you know, there is a certain pattern, but it's not exactly the same every day because it depends on a number of inputs. So, you know, the, the Joule recipe concept uh, is, is controlling frequency and on off timings based on uh, the, the air conditioning requirements in the building. So very specifically, it's looking at, uh, you know, out of the 40 plus two way walls that are there in the building, in the air handling units, uh, how open are they? Uh, you know, so these two way walls are controlled based on the temperature requirements and actual conditions. So, you know, if all the two-way walls are open, then the flow would be very high. If some of them are closed, you know, let's say an area is not occupied and it's closed, then the frequency will be low. So automatic control of chill water flow based on the requirements of the particular system. And, you know, this saves a lot of energy, uh, about 25% of the chill water pumps energy is saved just by, uh, you know, dynamic modulation of frequency of pumps. Uh, another example is if you look at chill water set points. So this is the actual chill water set point uh, history for one of the sites. So this is being controlled. Now again, you can see that you know the generic shape is the same, but you know if you look in detail every day, chill water set points are different. And the shape of the curve is slightly different every day because there's number of inputs. So what are the types of inputs that are being taken to control chill water set point? Uh, first is, you know, this is for a hospital building. So whether the operation theater is on or not on, uh, you know, critical operation theaters, because if they are on, you require low chill water set point because the humidity and temperature requirements in the operation theaters are more stringent and the other areas are not as much. So that is one of the inputs. What is the outdoor temperature, outdoor humidity, and what is the average supply temperature or, you know, area temperature across 10 different areas. So all these inputs taken into account and based on that you automatically control chill water set point and in this particular case about 8% of the consumption of the chill is reduced without uh, actually impacting the comfort level at all. In fact, improving the service level of the air conditioning that you need. Another example is a condenser pump, uh, you know, these are condenser pumps and the input basis here is what is the percentage loading of chillers at any given point of time. How effective are the cooling towers at that particular point of time? And what is the real time efficiency of the pumps that are being controlled? And, uh, you know, all these things are taken into account real time controlled and you get a lot of energy savings here as well. Uh, you know, here, uh, this one is about cooling tower fans. So, you know, again, you look at what the outside temperatures are, what is the condenser entry temperature, uh, what is the effectiveness of cooling towers and you modulate the cooling tower fans. Now, the next, uh, uh, sorry, so still on this cooling tower, uh, you know, so this is data for a site. You know, typically a cooling tower's function is to, uh, is to reduce the condenser inlet temperature or, or at least to make beneficial use of wet bulb conditions, right? So when your outdoor conditions are favorable, uh, you know, your cooling tower fan speeds would be low and condenser inlet, the, the, the temperature that the cooling tower supplies to the chiller should also be low. But, you know, in this case, you see that on a particular site before automation was done, uh, it was all over the place, it's random, there's no relationship between the water temperature supplied to the chiller and the outdoor wet bulb temperature whatsoever. So we're actually, you know, we were wasting all the infrastructure that was out there. And once you get to automation, you see a straight, almost a straight line. That means, you know, when you have lower, uh, more favorable ambient conditions, uh, uh, temperature supplied to the chiller is lower. So that actually helps in saving energy. So that is, you know, advantage of uh, con intelligent controls. Uh, the next example is the most interesting for today. Uh, and, you know, this is uh, getting closer and closer to uh, the, the subject of today, which is, uh, great interactive building. So here, uh, this is something that we call a tonnage injection. Uh, it started as an experiment, but now it has become a standard uh, kind of energy 
management measure. So if you look at a chiller, uh, this is a performance curve of a particular chiller. Okay, so uh, you know these equipment don't perform at the same efficiency under all conditions. They have different curves. So it, the, the, what this shows is that when the loading of a chiller becomes very low, let's say it's only twenty percent load, right? So late evenings, winter times, the efficiency of the chillers are not very good. They consume more power for every ton of cooling that is consumed that is produced by this chiller. So low percentage loading is bad efficiency. Uh, the other thing you see is that when you do have such low loading conditions, there is frequent on off. You know, I mean, look at the number of times that the chiller is on and off more than 20 times within like two hour window. That's not good for the compressor. Um, so, you know, it's bad for the chiller's life and, and unregulated tripping is bad for comfort as well. It's, uh, you know, you don't know how to manage this. It's a really nightmare for the people who are using it, especially when you have sensitivity to the temperature and humidity requirements. So, you know, we take some of these facts into account. And what we did is, you know, we came up with a, with a method to control all chillers, all condenser pumps, and all cooling towers and the chill water set point. So this is a tonnage injection. Okay. So control all of these things. Uh, and what does tonnage injection mean? Uh, you know, this means that you actually overcool the building for a little bit. Okay. So you overcool the building, you, you, you reduce the chill water set point, you know, to the minimum, you overcool the building, and then you shut the entire chillers, condenser pumps, and cooling towers off. So, so you just take all this, the, the largest load in the building, you just take it off. You know, you shut it off and then you let, then you observe what's happening in the building, right? you observe what is happening, how the temperatures are rising in different areas, all right? So control parameters, we all understood, right? Our, our objective here is to turn off chillers, condenser pumps, and cooling towers. And what are we observing? We observe the temperature and humidity conditions in five different areas. And we observe how long is it taking for the temperature in these areas and the humidity to actually rise uh, and, and, you know, come to levels which are not comfortable, right? So we pre-cool the area. And then we shut off the entire chillers, condenser pumps, and cooling towers. We observe how uh, the different areas in the facility are behaving. And, uh, you know, before they become uncomfortable, uh, you know, we turn these things back on. So what does it do? Uh, this enables us to reduce the load, control the load of the building. And in this particular example, 181 kilowatts of power were taken off the grid for 45 minute intervals each more than 10 times a day. Uh, so this is not, I mean, typically you think it's only demand response, but you know, because you're taking off condenser pumps and cooling towers as well, uh, it actually results in energy savings too, not just power reduction. So here's a curve. I mean, you can see here, you know, 440 kilowatt and you do this tonnage injection and you know, the, the consumption at that moment is high because the chill water set point is low, you're pre, you know, overcooling the building. Then you just turn everything off, the you know, power drops by 41%. And you observe and you see, okay, well, now it needs to be turned back on. So, you know, automatically turns back on. And then, and then you have time intervals, right? You don't let it turn back on in less than eight minutes uh, because the compressor needs to uh, also, uh, you know, be properly managed. So this is uh, you know, very interesting. And now this becomes very significant, right? I mean, imagine if you are able to take 180 kilowatts off the grid uh, in a particular single building, and, and imagine you have thousands of buildings like this. So you know it gets close to the kinds of numbers that we were hearing from National Grid earlier. You know, multiple megawatts of uh, demand that can be controlled. Um, and, you know, so I, so I wanted to go back to the concept of Joule recipe, you know, it's as easy as it's just four step process, right? What, what do you want to control? Uh, what, what, are, what are the rules of the control? All right. Uh, what do you want? You know, how do you want to control it? And then when do you want it to be controlled? Right. These are four steps. You can control any asset based on any logic uh, that you can think of and uh, achieve, you know, really, truly uh, dynamic, uh, dynamically operated buildings. So, uh, you know, just to share what's possible in, in buildings today, uh, you can control any equipment, chillers, pumps, cooling towers, air handling units, laundry equipment, water treatment system, hot water system, and other loads. And, and you can do this based on the availability of power, right? Generation forecasting, right? Um, and then, you know, if you're, if you're a Google and you're 
wanting to adopt more renewables, then you can even do it based on what is the share of renewables at that particular moment in the entire power supply. Or uh, you can control based on load forecasting. You can control based on spot power pricing. You can control based on comfort boundary conditions. Uh, you know, real time efficiency. So basically, you can use anything uh, as an input to control these things. And what we can achieve is, uh, you know, better plant load factors. Uh, you know, uh, utilization of the infrastructure that we have, which makes it more profitable. Uh, lower need to build more. Uh, we don't need to build more power plants, whether they are green or not. Um, lower pricing uh, for everybody, lower cost of energy and higher levels of reliability. So all these things can be achieved today and are being achieved today. And uh, we look forward to programs like Maitri to actually accelerate uh, the deployment of such uh, technologies and such practices so that, you know, uh, overall they can make a meaningful impact. Because uh, if, if 10 buildings do this, you know, nobody benefits except those 10 buildings. But if thousands of buildings do this, or for factories also do this, then uh, you know everybody benefits. So that's what I had for today, and thank you so much uh, to the organizers for inviting me here. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Arjun. I think that was a very interesting, uh, uh, you know, a sort of a glimpse of several innovations that you have managed in technology for buildings for smarter buildings. Uh, and um, uh, I mean, we hope that uh, uh, one day we will definitely visit one of these buildings uh, to actually see those innovations, a request that has come to us from, uh, you know, uh, some outfits within Government of India. Uh, with that, I will now uh, turn over to Mr. Atul Bali, who is the Chief General Manager uh, from the National Smart Grid Mission of Government of India. Atul ji is a veteran in power sector, more than almost three decades of experience of working with several central public sector units, including Power Finance Corporation, Power Grid. Currently, he's posted at the National Smart Grid Mission, which is a, a kind of an outfit that was set up by the Ministry of Power um, to look at the planning and the policy making and program implementation to accelerate smart grids in India. So it's a nodal agency for smart grids in the country. And uh, Atul, I've had the pleasure of working with Atulji on, on, uh, on the National Smart Grid uh, missions, uh, several programs, right from the inception stage. So he's been there right from the beginning. Uh, and that's why we brought the National Smart Grid. We partnered with them even for this new initiative because we thought that uh, you know buildings should be seen uh, you know, should now be seen as an integral part of a smart grid solution rather than a standalone uh, kind of a domain area. And I think um, with Atulji's leadership at the National Smart Grid Mission, perhaps we will hear a lot from him today as well in the se series of dialogues that we will have in January on how the two can be integrated and a new narrative built for our country. Over to you, Atulji. Uh, Namaskar and welcome to all. Thank you, Apurvaji, for a nice intro. And uh, I must first acknowledge at the moment that this Zero in Dialogue has rather provided new platform because as far as our understanding goes, as far as my personal understanding goes, I would say net zero building, okay, that was an idea that is being done in isolation is a good uh, reformative idea to make our building more efficient and making it net zero so that it can be self-sustainable. But now taking a step further to have a grid interactive, that is, I think, laying down the stepping stone. Because in Indian context, I must thank, I must also acknowledge uh, the presentation. Very good uh, concept setting by Nidhiji, then John, and then Mona and Amrita, of course. They also given a very good presentation and uh, gone into the tools and how it can be done and demand response done in US and national grid and about the smart cities done by very beautifully by Amrita. And lastly, the Arjun who has done really in the ground zero, basically, in all the basically facts, buildings where this is happening. But that is on a particularly, I would say, on a standalone basis or something like that. But more problems would come when we'll be going into the grid interactive mode. And that is the crucial stepping stone of the crucial aspect of our 
smart grid as such. When we talk of the smart grid as such, then we visualize a secure and reliable grid. And keeping in mind the peak load and demand response and everything going like that, we very well have an idea. Then when we have to ramp up in the evening, that would be a real challenge. And going with the COP21 and EV30 at the 30 target we have taken and the energy injection going into that and energy withdrawal coming from that, then we have to ramp up. And ramp up that ask for suitable measures. But of course, going by the fact that uh, nearly, I think I uh, would give the data nearly 30%, that is our residential or the building consumption in the India at the moment. And going by the accessibility through large program we just completed two years back when we have given access to every household. Now our peak load is touching nearly two gigawatt. And going by the further target and the growth nearly nine to 10 percent in latent capacity and everything looking at that perspective, then we have a lot miles to cover. And keeping that in mind, the peak load and everything like that, this net zero energy efficient building is going to play a greater rather it will be setting up an agenda because a lot of building and urbanization is coming on the way, smart cities and everything being integrated. So that is a real challenge and challenge we have to accept. But when it will be grid interactive, what is we are looking at? We are looking at um, grid complexities, no doubt. Then we are looking at the reliability factor. And of course, crucial in a Indian context is the affordability. Of course, there's an economy of scale, a lot of things are there. India is a member of the seed as such, under clean energy ministry here, we, have, we are focusing on smart or energy efficient equipment deployment, rather than appliance deployment in a large scale and efficient matter. But economy affordability would be the key concern, keeping in mind our large populace and going with the fact uh, that we have just embarked upon a very large scale smart meeting program. And when we talk of the smart meter, that is really a new thing as, as such in Indian context, because that will not only be at, at providing a real-time monitoring to the each and every home, but it will be providing energy auditing and everything like that on a single platter. But more so, we have a also feature in that that also provide for the standardization in that IS-164 when we talk about smart meter, home automation. And when through IoT, we have this all equipment on place, then energy mon monitoring, control, demand management, load management, and everything through a tip of a mobile app and everything to a consumer when we are giving that. And of course, with the rooftop solar coming into a large way in our houses and um, giving a new insight toward a consumer turning into prosumer. And we are seeing that happening. And because of that happening in a very fast way, in a rapid way, Utility has started shifting from net metering to gross metering. We very well know that net metering is providing some disincentive to the utility, of course, incentive to the consumer as such, but uh, keeping in mind the financial health of the utility that is creating more problem as such. That also we looked into that perspective when we are talking of the net zero grid interactive building. So that's another aspect when we look at this time, but of course, reducing energy waste, making it more efficient, and interacting with the grid. And of course, imbibing the demand response and all that, and keeping in mind the new tariff regime which is coming into the way, and open access and everything. Then I think the smart grid and smart buildings or the net zero building, they have to grow together. And keeping in mind the parameters and technical interventions and the way ahead and the parameter we have to set up the stepping stone or the direction we are looking at, and I think, this net zero dialogue has given a right contextual setting to that particular parameter. And it's a way to go. And uh, synchronization between this uh, buildings, net zero buildings and smart grid is very much necessary. And um, we are looking at data analytics. We are looking at artificial intelligence, machine learning, all these tools, which will be a handy when we are looking up the synchronization of the boat. And uh, keeping in mind that I think um, this dynamic tariff and load shifting and all that, but Amrita also dwelled upon during the smart cities presentation. And uh, that will be a very critical and crucial aspect to look at. 
and from smart grid perspective earlier when we are thinking of um, providing access to the each and every consumer or household in our country then we are thinking of off grid type of a micro grid like thing but now keeping in mind this grid interactive smart buildings or the net zero building there is a lot more propensity or lot more opportunity came into coming into being but we have to chart out a path in the smart grid implementation that is to start with maybe with the urban concept and we have to see that happen because we have done it on a pilot stage in demand response and other thing like that and chillers as such as coming to being some limited areas we have tried that but how to proceed further that i think we have to when we'll be coming up with and finishing with this zero in dialogue we have to think of these pilots in that particular concept and i think that may be a one of the feedback uh, to usaid in this matri program how we can develop on it further and of course um, uh, i must say ki we have been associated with usaid and uh, for a long we started with paper presentation and paper preparation technical reports and all that then we done ajmer last time also we discussed and then we have developed certain tools along with usaid and of course apurva played a key role in that and capacity building and all that that will also be very essential and these dialogues are providing much more i think required impetus in that direction because we generally don't understand that much how much that will be getting into that other way we just looking from the energy efficiency point of view stand alone dsm measures but this would be a real challenging times ahead and um, going by the experience in other part of the world and more so as uh, i think arjun was presenting in indian context by giving a very good uh, title also jewel recipe and uh, tonnage injection and all that like that so i'm very happy to note that and definitely that has to be looked into and uh, observed how it is being done and of course we are coming up with the very good uh, um international incubation center in the smart grid knowledge center that of course um usaid is helping into that building up that platform target is making that happen and smart grid is facilitating smart grid mission is facilitating so i think in that if that some prototype can be developed that can also be setting up a good context and the like i think we have invited major incubator to happen the, at that particular place so keeping that in mind perspective i think a very nice presentation and nice uh, i think uh, this series of dialogues and at the end of that we i think we can definitely come out with paper and as we say in nsgm and smart grid road maps so maybe we can develop some road map how to go ahead in this direction and how to realize this basically grid interactive because this is as a concept we have developed upon and this is new learning as far as i am concerned on personal basis but it has a immense potential in immense potential because india has large growth to come and because of more access and rather everybody has been provided access there is a latent power hidden and huge transformation happening and government is also already seized of that multiple initiatives going on so i think keeping that in mind um, i wish good luck and uh, this zero in dialogue will definitely pave a good way and i must acknowledge um, this matri program and role played by apurva and i'm thankful to all the presenters today and wish that that their vision and their uh, rather aspirations would come true in the time to come thank you and thank you invited me in this particular program and associated with anand ji this thank you thank you so much atul ji for uh, you know um, setting this at least i would say vision and mission what a uh, smart grid would mean for india and how a uh, newer elements could be incorporated as part of the smart grid and that's the whole reason when we thought about this whole initiative on grid interactive net zero energy buildings uh, we came to you and the national smart grid mission to uh, you know spearhead this effort from the government of india side uh, because you know having worked with the smart grid mission i know that uh, you would be defining the road map uh, you would be the key agency for defining the smart grid road map for the country and this is something that uh, at least i've heard several times from the ministry of power uh, to include more elements as part of the smart grid uh, and not just restricted to uh, the uh, you know notional and the normal things that are talked about which 
which is a smart meter or a SCADA or you know the normal typical grid modernization uh, technologies but go far beyond that something that the honorable minister kopar himself uh, stated in one of the meetings and uh, just uh, in that context we received a request just day before from the ministry about actually uh, helping a study visit to us to understand more elements of smart grid as the ministry is now finalizing a whole road map and a report on what smart grid would mean for india so before they do that they really want to have a exposure visit to understand more elements and i think perfect opportune time for us to introduce the grid interactive net zero energy buildings and we had speakers from us today from you know uh, the national grid and I'm, there are several other examples in the us where these things have already been implemented and you know uh, and an opportunity for us to integrate buildings grid interactive buildings as a smart uh, you know as a solution for a smart grid or as an integral part so very rightly you pointed out usa would be very keen to uh, you know support government of india on uh, you know on this particular journey again just like we initiated the green building movement uh, back in 2000 early 2000 which john had spearheaded uh, under his leadership again Uh, we would move this new narrative, uh, uh, which we just seeded, but uh, it's very early stages. I hope this dialogue is just the trigger or the catalyzer uh, for um, a new, not only discussion but actual, uh, you know, roadmap and then implementation uh, for the smart grid journey in the country as well as in South Asia, which is grappling with similar issues. This uh, India's uh, learning and India's, you know. Uh, the journey would be keenly watched by by other south asian nations as well and therefore a huge opportunity for us to take that forward uh, within the south asia and the indo pacific context as well uh, so thank you so much to all the speakers uh, who uh, you know from start to finish were there with us and i'm sure will continue to be with us uh, as we continue this narrative uh, but uh, also to all the participants who kept clued in uh into this uh, discussion i'm sure a lot of questions will be there so i will now hand it over to tanmay to take us through the question answer session thank you uh yeah we have about 10 12 minutes for a few questions uh and uh, some of them uh, uh have been answered while the session was on but uh, uh you know really fantastic to hear from everyone and we have uh, uh really a, a a diverse range of participants today uh i'm in fact uh, welcome ralph you've been uh, up i don't know at 3 am to participate uh, it's good to have you uh, somit that has joined as co-founder of smart gaia so we have a, a lot of very uh, interesting panelists i would encourage people to uh, ask questions uh and maybe you know i sort of uh, reading a few uh mona from uh from your perspective you know one of the questions that keep coming up again and again should the changes be driven by regulation or is there a business case for doing this can it be purely business uh what's the role of incentives in getting this value into the system uh who's responsible what should come first is policy necessary so all those sort of a broad question on how do you actually approach this question so i don't think it's an either or it's i think the policy needs to go hand in hand with you know uh engaging with customers as well so i think one of the examples that we're seeing right now in downstate new york is we have um certain constraints on our gas systems and so you know we can't build new pipelines because that aligns with the climate goals that are set in new york um we need to make sure that now we engage with our customers to reduce demand but then we need policies in place that allows that to happen as well from a policy perspective so i i don't think it's an either or i think those both sort of go hand in hand uh with with decisions that get made for for uh you know achieving carbon emission reductions great and one more thought that 
came to uh, my mind when I was looking at your presentation is your approach to looking at industry engagement because you have these manufacturers and technologies and products that are pre-approved that fit into your ecosystem of uh, looking at efficiency and demand management and how's been that experience because you know a lot of public utilities face that challenge and they're going to look at it from that perspective of how can we get that industry engaged and also in a way i guess provide uh, an incentive for more uh, manufacturers and service providers to enter the system so the approach has really been and is shifting towards being more market driven where you know we have uh, a way in which we engage with our large commercial customers is really one on one so if you're a really large customer we have a, an account manager who reaches out to the customers understands what they are looking for but as we move forward i think the way we are looking at some of the localized constraints is to really have market the market drive those solutions so typically we would issue a uh, a request for a proposal for a certain area and say, you know, we're looking for uh, an energy efficiency or a demand response or a complete sort of um, reduction solution in this area. And then we really leave it up to the market to respond. So there are market enactors who would say, you know, this is what I can do within a specific building. I think uh, the jewel being an example, right? So the utility says, this is my constraint area. Can you some market enabler deliver some reduction for me over here. So that's one of the other ways that we are looking now at uh, at this this problem. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mona. Uh, coming to you, Amrita. Uh, you, you know, there's such a comprehensive uh, a web of these uh, systems that need to work together, and uh, the question that is asked very often is, you know, when you're looking at smart cities and new cities coming up, there is a, you start with this basic infrastructure that enables all of this. But uh, when you're looking at existing infrastructure, existing cities, utilities, buildings, uh, is there an Im incremental approach and how should that be done? Uh, should it, is there a, uh, a case for creating a standard protocol, communication platforms that are common. How does one do this incrementally in our existing cities and infrastructure? Sure. So as you said, it's a comprehensive web and, uh, you know, um, from a smart cities perspective, at least in India, these all have been brownfield cities, right, with existing uh, infrastructure some addition of course but like you know it's been brownfield cities with existing uh, water systems sewage systems lighting uh, and so on and looking at where you're bringing in the automation and hence like you know and also an energy efficiency lens in some of these things so it needs actually a convergence of many things like you know one is obviously you need regulation regulation which says that okay i need these things right so if uh, there is a regulation that says uh, you know, 80% uh, of uh, the power usage by government buildings needs to come from solar rooftop. Then, like, you know, uh, they start moving in that particular direction of procuring, like, you know, the technologies needed uh, for that particular, like, you know, area, right? The other thing is around tariffs and penalties. So, uh, I mean, if you look at industry or some of the larger commercial buildings, like, you know, railway stations and so on being large net consumers of electricity, and if you have tariffs and penalties that uh, like in you know, a reward good behavior and uh, like in you know, a sort of punish uh, behaviors that you want to restrict, then like, you know, you start seeing a movement from people to say, okay, yes, I will look at more energy efficient solutions, right? Like, you know, otherwise it is a good to have, it is not a must to have. Technology again, like you know, is evolving. So if we look at any of the waste to energy plants or biomethanation, while like you know, I had mentioned that the capacity, uh, installed capacity, is a lot less than the potential that uh, we talk about in India, but that is uh, due to two reasons. Like you know, one is that the technology itself is evolving, and you don't know, uh, you know, what sort of technology will work in certain uh, scenarios, depending on the exact uh, nature of 
waste for example that gets collected or the exact like you know sort of uh, tds and ph and affluence and like you know like uh, uh, which are there in wastewater and so on and hence like you know what is the best technology that will work and it will be cost efficient and like you know like uh, work better so there are, are still like you know like uh, choices being made on the technology side but also equally like you know the linkages of uh, if some of these like you know biomethanation plants or waste to energy plants need to contribute back to the grid right how do they do it what is the policy what is the rate at which they do it like you know is it going to be cost effective for them is the roi of establishing that plant going to work out uh, you know, uh, based on the tariff that they will collect, or is it really going to remain government funded for a, a period of time, which then reduces the incentive for the government to act on it, right? Like, you know, so 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 there are like, you know, those kinds of things. And then there are procurement challenges, because again, I mean, like, you know, a lot of the government uh, procurement really happens on uh, low cost. And, um, uh, you know, then it doesn't become like, you know, like efficiency or optimization doesn't really remain the prime motive or the prime driver of uh, technology choices. So again, like, you know, how do you play with that? How do you ensure, uh, I mean, there are many examples, let's say of street lighting, where you're putting in street lighting, where it is, of course, like, you know, energy efficient, you're moving from the traditional to the LED, but like, you know, you could have chosen to make it smart, which meant that you installed controllers and actuators and you're able to flip and like, you know, like you're able to manage like, you know, the uh, duration at which like, you know, these uh, things are on or off and so on. And again, those are choices which have not been made in many cities because purely for cost reasons. Right. So there so, are many like, you know, it's a complex thing. No, I think that provides a very good perspective of, you know, one really can't start at one end. It really needs to be looked at from uh, from different perspectives at the same time. Uh, Sumit, while you're here, maybe you can tell me a little bit about, you know, uh, uh, from a NSGM, we heard that there is this smart meter rollout and there's uh, now a national imperative to move towards net zero emissions. So can you uh, link the smart meter rollout, the intelligence that comes with it, to linking it to uh, our uh, net zero emissions future? And can there be a business case for it? So I think when I look at the national policy and the rollout construct that has been put forward, again, it went down to the concept of buying the cheapest meter that is possible that works on a 2G network. So that was like tying um, uh, tying a big rock in in somebody's feet and say, asking them to run. That network is not working. 700,000 or maybe up to a million meters have been put already on the ground, but it is not really effective so far. Second is the data that is going to get collected needs to create that nudge economics, need to tell people that don't do something because it is. So we don't have differential tariffs. We can have smart meters, but without differential tariffs, the behavior won't change. So, th so that's what I'm saying that can, can smart meters enable that change in behavior? Can smart meters, you know, you have to start it somewhere. So you start yeah, with yeah, the Fuji yeah. meters and you go. But the whole point is, is there a way for us to effectively link our climate strategy? And uh, yeah, may maybe Atulji will come with up policy. with policy. With yeah. policy, yes, you it, it that's the start. You will now know the difference. But we didn't need the smart meter to tell people to do that. Policy alone could have got there without the smart meter. Now the smart meter will tell you that at 4.52 in the evening is where your peak is. Mm -hmm. I knew it. It was sometime in the afternoon. I just didn't need to know it was 4.52. I'm just giving you a... a yeah. A, no, no, that's a, that's a, that's a good question. But it could Maybe, any time uh, of the day. Yeah. Atulji, you would like to respond to this. Yeah, I think... Um, first of all, to comment on this 2G, I think we have come a long way. When it has to be started, I think we started with the smart grid pilots and all that, and we tested with different technologies. Mm -hmm. I failed to add that one point during uh, the smart grid and smart building context. I think the key factor would be the communication. Yeah. When we talk of two, uh, I think two-way direction communication and everything, the key part is communication. Yes. When we talk of communication, keeping that in mind, what we have changed in this RDSS scheme and 250 million meters smart meter drive is we have gone to the OPEX model, the DD foot model. 
and US not better because they have been associated with while developing these all concept and all that. Keeping that in mind, we have left the communication option to the system integrator. But of course, very well said by the previous speaker, until and unless we facilitate that, we facilitate this time of use tariff or the dynamic tariff or other thing like that. Smart meter primarily is not meant for ATNC loss reduction. That is a byproduct. Of course, yeah. that can be done without smart meter also, agreed. But the visualization, but the monitoring and keeping in mind the concept we are having at the moment at the ground. So that gives us more visibility. We have seen that utilities without funding, like indoor, they have tested and they have been giving back to the consumer. I think one point very well mentioned by, I think, Madam uh, uh, Chandra, I think, I forgot her, Mona. Yeah, Mona. Consumer engagement, that is a very key factor. And in that context, I might, must um, admit that in a bare pilot project, we have acknowledged that. And even in the indoor, what they have done, their utility not only benefited, they pass on the benefit of the power factor improvement to the, to the consumers. That builds the confidence. And of course, definitely there is a huge scope for that. And until unless we all incentivize and integrate these all factors, then open up these parameters that are inherent part of the smart meter. And I must add, this IS non capable standard smart meter. When we talk of smart meter, smart meter, when we started in pilot project, it was just like elephant story, blind looking at a different perspective from elephant, how it looked like. But now we have a standard. In that, there is a scope for home automation system also to be integrated along with that. Huge possibility. When we have it, we start with certain things. Let there be a visibility, consumer, prepaid metering, everything like that. Slowly, it will come into that when the regulator, everything also on board, and consumer benefit, utility also unsustainable, then these all measures will definitely, that's why I was saying, we have to adopt baby step and we have to achieve that utility slowly. Because India is a diverse country and a very big country and economy would be a key factor, affordability. Well, thank you. I think that's, that's exactly the point that over a period of time, the technology will change, the protocols will change and business models will evolve. And yeah. that actually gives me a perfect segue to ask Arjun this question yeah. that, you know, you've brought together technology, but a lot of it is based on your intelligence and your understanding of how systems work, right? Not equipment, not individual things. So uh, when we look at this technology and adoption at scale, uh, how valuable it is to be contextual, have that understanding of one system versus another, or is there a case for there certain things that can be done at scale, having the basic understanding? And, and does it work both in terms of efficiency and also the example that you gave of tonnage injection? I can see a direct application to balancing the grid, uh, not just for efficiency, but also saying, okay, this is the time I have excess energy uh, in the system. Maybe I can do thermal storage or something like that. So what is the, you know, what's the balance between this scale intelligence and human intervention excellent question Tanmay. Uh, something that we think about all the time because you know as i mentioned uh, making 10 buildings 100 buildings 35 percent more efficient doesn't really benefit the planet and that's the goal that which uh, with which we are working so uh, you know the, the the true answer to this is i i think about 80 percent it's like 80 20 so about 80 percent can be kind of standardized and then about 20% needs to be customized uh, in my experience. So, you know, uh, so when we started, I'll just uh, explain this with the June recipes, right? When we started, uh, we custom designed June recipes for every equipment in every site. And that would take a long time and that would take a lot of understanding of the facility, etc. But, you know, then over time when we got a lot of facilities, we realized that the air conditioning system in one facility was another almost the same. So as long as you are uh, you are standardizing your approach of collecting the right information, and, and you know you can standardize Joule recipes. So now our interface also looks very different. You know it gives you options one, two, three, four, five, six. Pop, you know and you just like click on it and it's done instead of you know writing the logics every single time. So uh, you know with the right strategy, about eighty percent of what you do can be standardized and replicated without any customization. And you know, one should always focus on the impact that one can make uh, without, without too much of customization so that you can scale. And scale is the most important. 
Yeah. Thank yeah. you. And and there are a number of questions for you. A lot of people have asked for your contacts and your presentations. Uh, you can see them. You can respond to some of them online, and we'll pass them all to to you. Uh, Thank you. I think we're kind of running out of time. So the last sort of I'd like to give a minute or two to Ralph because you've now seen uh, the whole discussion and uh, just your thoughts on you know where technology fits in when we move towards this whole ideal of buildings being a part of the smart grid and grid interactive. So uh, can you hear me okay? Yep. Uh, yeah, I, I, I do think the challenge, you know, we, we cannot just depend on technologies. And I, I think that uh, there has been tremendous investment. For instance, I know in the state of California, they've uh, installed smart meters, uh, advanced metering infrastructure throughout the state, and they have yet to really utilize it in the manner in which it was intended. Um, so I do think that it does get down to individual utilities that are working to look at specific targeted loads. Um, I think, you know, Mona's example, um, I think uh, Arun, is the, the, the technical example there, looking at buildings, and, and utilities and targeting. I think the presentation I made, made at the last session um, talking about the Grid Optimal Buildings Initiative where we're, we're looking at very specific metrics for grid-friendly buildings. And if we're, if we're thinking about net zero buildings and the role that they can play, uh, we understand, we need to understand what metrics are really at play as well. Um, and so I think the, the targeted approach of assessing buildings for their grid friendliness or designing and building new buildings to be grid friendly. Uh, but then I think the utilities can take a, a kind of a, a broad approach like Mona was talking about with consumers and then a targeted approach in specific kind of grid constrained areas uh, to implement the infrastructure um, and actually get those uh, the both, you know, total load reduction and, and uh, demand response uh, to address those concerns. And, and I think then over time, you can move to um, having the entire infrastructure uh, work in this in this um, integrative way. I think you know for I mean the whole origin of the utility system was one way power supply, and now we're moving to this interactive grid and and soon to bring on, uh, for instance, two way charging vehicles and and so we have to see you know over time how all of these things get integrated. I think it's great to pilot these technologies in new buildings. Um, and, and, and show what's possible, but to do this across the entire uh, country is, is going to be a pretty massive challenge. So I say, start with the buildings, start with the utility, you know, at a, a um, I think um, uh, Amruta talked about the, um, you know, at the village scale, at the uh, city scale, uh, and then we can get to uh, the larger impact. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think we'll, we're, yeah, we're out of time. Uh, we have, uh, I mean, I can see a lot of participants who are engaged uh, and many of the, our attendees are all working in this area. I can see Mahesh Patankar and Mahesh Ramanujam being part of, we would in fact probably have them as part of our future discussions and many other people. So uh, I think uh, from our uh, current uh, perspective on, on looking at technologies, we, we've got a, a, a clear answer, I think, that you, know, you need to look at scale, you need to look at application, it needs to be contextual. At the same time, there are certain things that are scalable. And that's the, uh, the, the learning and, and Ralph's point that you do need to start at one end. You can't really always be looking at the entire national grid and you know, the problems will really be very different as you scale up. So you need to start looking at it, look, look at consumers and their profiling and their requirements, the utilities and their requirements and industry businesses and their requirements and it'll all come together from that one unit. So with that, uh, uh, back to you Apurva and uh, John, uh, if you have any other comments then, uh, bye. No, I think that was a very interesting discussion we had in terms of question answers. And I, I could see a lot of more questions there. And I'm sure our team will respond to you in due uh, time along with the presentations 
will be made available to you. But uh, just to uh, summarize this and as next steps, I mean, I won't even uh, dare to go that path of summarizing today's discussions because, uh, you know, they were so enriching and uh, range from one to the other. Uh, but just as next step, uh, we are next uh, in the series, the third uh, as part of the Zero in Dialogue would be on January 12th. Uh, and there we will have, uh, you know, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, uh, um, you know, Marianne from there, uh, who would be talking about Calflex Hub, a platform for advancing energy uh, management, uh, dynamic energy management. And then the fourth the one will be on January 19th. That would be with National Building Institute, uh, with uh, uh, Ralph, with Smita and Alexi Miller of New Buildings Institute. And that would be focused around the grid uh, optimal initiative and also describe the utility challenge. So uh, the fourth one would be on that. You will be, uh, all of you would be receiving the invites for those sessions uh, very soon. And we hope you will join us back uh, into this interesting discussion. Uh, uh, the final one, uh, we will be actually taking all the insights from all these series and then putting our own, uh, you know, thoughts uh, on, you know, uh, on paper in the form of a white paper, which would uh, basically talk about the roadmap and the implementation framework for uh, grid interactive net zero energy buildings the taking into account the technologies uh, emerging policies and design aspects and consumer engagement all those insights uh, will be woven in into that white paper and we hope that white paper will serve as a strong basis or a foundation on which the you know grid interactive net zero energy buildings initiative uh, can be will be taken forward of course usaid will definitely uh, push this further as we kind of uh, move in from one project to the other. It doesn't matter which project it under uh, is part of, but the point is that this narrative will continue to be, uh, you know, uh, seeded and promoted. Uh, and uh, we do look forward to more partnerships. Of course, the National Smart Grid Mission is there. The Ministry of Power is uh, behind this, uh, but, you know, more pr private sector associations, partners to take this initiative forward. So with that, I would just like to thank all the speakers, all the participants, uh, you know, our team, uh, EDS team, which is implementing the METRI program, uh, Tanmay, Nidhi, and Amika, and all those who are working behind the scenes uh, to get this going. Uh, John, of course, uh, it's he's on uh, right now on holidays. It's a leap time for him, but he's been consistently providing his leadership and his passion for energy uh, is seen uh, you know uh, he's been almost attending and uh, in right from monday when he holiday started he's been on events continuously since then during his holiday time time so thank you john for staying put uh, also uh, to the speakers mona uh, you know uh, atul ji uh, arjun uh, everyone, um, Ralph was also there, so that was uh, uh, another, you know, uh, surprise. I would say I, I didn't anticipate that. Ralph, Amrita, uh, all the speakers and uh, all the participants. So with that, uh, good evening and a good morning, and uh, hope you have a safe day. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Really great Bye -bye. discussion. Very interesting, very inspiring. Thanks all. Thank you. Happy holidays to you. Happy Thank holidays, you. everyone. Thank you. Bye bye.